I'm Liz Faubles and this is Currents. Tonight, two stories dominate our news. The conclave to select the successor to St. Peter is just hours away. First though, we begin in Brooklyn. A great man, a great priest has passed away. Auxiliary Bishop Ignatius Catanello is being remembered tonight for his Christ-like suffering and everlasting pastoral work. The bishop was born in Brooklyn. He was a student in and of the city, earning an NYU doctorate in religious studies and two master's degrees from St. John's University. He entered the priesthood in 1966 and was elevated to bishop almost 20 years ago. One of his passionate ministries was young men and women. He taught theology at his alma mater, St. John's, for almost three decades. In recognition of his dedication, the university awarded him its President's Medal. Bishop Catanella also understood the power of communications in evangelizing today's world. Four years ago, he dedicated our current studios and chapel, offering his prayers and support to NET's television mission. At the time, he recalled those who helped him decide to become a priest. You know, when a person goes into the seminary or is thinking about becoming a priest, somewhere along the way, and I know my brother priest would, would agree with me here, somebody's going to ask you, who influenced you? You know, who did that for you? And I always say, and I've been saying it as a priest now for 43 years, uh, two people did. Uh, one was my eighth grade nun, who is deceased now, and her, my eighth grade nun, who kept getting on my case all the time. Um, did you ever think about the priesthood? You should be thinking about the priesthood. Because I was thinking about being a doctor. Uh, and it stayed with me a long, long time to want to be a doctor. In fact, in college I was pre-med, getting ready to go into the, into the medical field. But, you know the old saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. You know, it never, it never materialized. Medical school never materialized. Uh, and the second person that influenced me a great deal was uh, Bishop Sheen. Uh, I used to come home from school and couldn't wait on that particular night to listen to him. And he still does that for me. He still uh, moves me very, very much. And Bishop Catanello took that inspiration straight to the people all across our diocese. Among the lives he touched, the chancellor of our diocese, Monsignor Anthony Hernandez, and Monsignor Joseph Grimaldi, our vicar of Brooklyn. He was just one with the people. Uh, he was out in front of church. He was involved with the people. Um, even with, as his, he was appointed bishop, it didn't change his basic persona. He stayed the same humble, um, compassionate, kind man that he always was um, and that was a real blessing to the diocese the thing about him is that when you encountered him you encountered him as a person you know it was yeah he was a bishop but he was always uh, very accessible and humble and interested in, in in you as an individual and i think that's very attractive to to young people and to to adults as well i mean he really even in the midst of his illness he was always looking to take care of people looking to help people out uh, putting his own needs secondary to trying to help uh, give, give people a helping hand uh, when needed. So he was a very special person. Yeah, even his illness uh, did not in any way limit him or incapacitate him in terms of relating, as you indicate, especially to young people. Um, that they felt, I would dare say, even a, a stronger bond with him in his illness, in his suffering. Well, it was clear he had a very deep spirituality. And it's also clear he had a great love of the Diocese of Brooklyn and priesthood. And, uh, and, you know, that permeated through his, his whole being. He was someone that really loved the church. He loved to serve the church and, you know, was interested in being present in whatever way he could. I mean, he went from administrative positions to pastoral positions to, you know, being one of the, the New York Mets' biggest supporters. So he was a very, um, very active person that really, really uh, sought to bring Christ's presence in a, in a real way to people. News director Ed Wilkinson is also the editor-in-chief of our diocesan newspaper, The Tablet. He's reported on Bishop Catanello and known the man for years. Brooklyn just poured out of him. You know, he was a real Brooklyn guy. He was a neighborhood guy, and he could talk about the neighborhoods. He could talk about growing up in Williamsburg, and, and he went to Most Holy Trinity High School, which is back there in the old neighborhood. And uh, he was just, he was very approachable. And in the parishes that he was assigned to, he was particularly attractive to young people. They flocked to Bishop. They, call, they would call him Bishop Iggy. Bishop Iggy is how all the kids knew him. And the kids in the parish knew that if they needed somebody to talk to, there was a listening ear in the rectory. Uh, uh, they really related to, to Bishop Iggy, and 
And you could see there were so many young people who are now young adults who came to him and visited him in his, uh, in his, in his sick bed and in, his, in the rectory while he was rehabbing. Uh, it was a tremendous uh, outpouring of love for Bishop Catnell. He was just a great guy who everybody could relate to. I think they respected him because they would go to him for advice. They knew that he had something to say. They knew he was a smart man. They knew he was a man of the church. Uh, and, they, and they knew they could count on him as a friend. So I think when people would go to him for advice, they knew they were going to get good advice. He wasn't just going to give you the party line, but he was going to tell you something that uh, he could relate to. He could, he could tell you something that he felt. And at the same time, uh, it, was, it, was, it was so much of, of what the church teaches because uh, Bishop uh, Catanella was just, he was a man of the church, but he was a man and he was from the church. I mean, those two things were just blended very well with him. Oh, well, Pope Benedict accepted Bishop Catanello's resignation for reasons of health in 2010. Tonight, funeral arrangements are being planned. Welcome back. Tonight, all eyes are turned to Rome as the world awaits the convening of the Cardinals to elect a new Pope, the Conclave, now just hours away. The drama is intense as the Cardinals gathered earlier today for their final preliminary meetings. By every news account, including off-the-record interviews with several Cardinals, no frontrunner has emerged. And a split between Curia Cardinals based at the Vatican and outsiders led by the American delegation has reportedly ruptured the college. The inside are said to be backing the candidacy of Brazilian Cardinal Odilo Scherer, himself a former Vatican man, while the U.S. Cardinals and their allies are reportedly aligning behind Cardinal Angelo Scola, the Archbishop of Milan. At the heart of all the maneuvering, a clash over reform of the Roman Curia, the bureaucracy that runs the Vatican. Leaked documents and a still secret investigation have highlighted the need for changes. A top church expert describes what he thinks is going on behind closed doors. There's this kind of guerrilla insurrection going on among cardinals from other parts of the world, including some Americans, who are very theologically conservative but very progressive in terms of business management that really want to shake things up around this place. And I think part of the drama of this conclave is going to be which one of those currents prevails. As the pressure to elect a successor to St. Peter's mounts, the cardinals face the added burden of trying to make their choice quickly. They know that if this conclave goes more than three or four days, the drumbeat in the media will be paralysis and crisis in the Vatican. So they want to get this wrapped up. On the other hand, right now, they don't have a clear front runner. So they've got about four days to get their act together so this does not become a gridlocked conclave. Well, most of the world's billion plus Catholics don't worry about appearances or gridlock, they just want a pope. <laughs> And yesterday, by the thousands, the faithful flocked to churches in Rome to celebrate Mass with members of the college. Cardinal Dolan was at his titular church, Our Lady of Guadalupe, outside the Vatican. He tested his Italian on the parishioners, telling them the church was his favorite after St. Patrick's. Then he expressed the reason for wanting to go home. See, I'm ready to go home. I ran out of socks. <laughs> hey, Cardinal Dolan, how are you feeling this morning? Hey, oh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here in a parish. This is the life of the church. Sunday Mass is so important, and I'm eager to get a new pope and to get back home. I'm running out of socks. Thank you. 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 You can go and go to bed. And current special coverage of the conclave begins tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. in New York with complete on-the-scene coverage directly from Rome. But before then, the crucial question, what exactly happens inside the conclave? Here now, some answers. It's the oldest enduring electoral system in the world, and many of its traditions have been unchanged for centuries. The conclave, which literally means locked with a key, dates back to a time when cardinals were locked in until they chose a new pope. Now it's the world that's locked out, figuratively speaking, as much of the conclave will take place behind closed doors. The gathering begins with a morning mass in St. Peter's Basilica. In the afternoon, the 115 voting cardinals, those under 80 years old, enter the Sistine Chapel where each will take an oath of secrecy. The penalty? Automatic excommunication. 
After the oath, preparations are made for the election, taken by secret ballot. Lots are drawn to select three cardinals who will help collect ballots, three more cardinals to count the votes, and three others to review the results. Printed on the ballots, the words, Eligio in sumum pontificum, meaning, I elect as supreme pontiff. Each elector writes the name of one candidate on the lower half of the ballot and folds it in half. Cardinals are not allowed to vote for themselves. Then, in order of seniority, the cardinals take their ballots to the altar. Each places a folded ballot onto a small disc, and then the ballot is dropped into a chalice. Once all the votes are cast, the ballots are tallied, and the results are read aloud. More than a two-thirds majority is needed to declare a winner, in this case, 77 votes. If there is no winner, there's another vote. If there is still no winner, two more votes are scheduled for the afternoon. Voting continues up to four ballots each day until there is a winner. The ballots are burned after each session in an incinerator inside the chapel, sending off the most famous smoke signal in the world. If there's no winner, they're burned with a chemical that gives off black smoke, telling the crowd waiting in St. Peter's Square that a new pope has not yet been selected. When there is a winner, the ballots are burned alone, giving off white smoke, a sign from the cardinals that they have chosen a new pope to lead the church. It's also very interesting. Again, a reminder, you can count on Currents to report every development first. And as it happens, special team coverage begins tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Well, as we anxiously stand by for the Cardinals to convene in Conclave, Cardinal Francis George of Chicago was saying that right now, the will of God is not entirely clear. This is a momentous occasion, the Cardinal says, and he is asking for prayers offered to the Holy Spirit so that his heart and mind are open to God's will. The church leader says he needs help to understand what God wants for the people of the world as he prepares to cast his ballot at the Conclave. Also in Rome tonight, covering the conclave, our correspondent, Grant Galicho. Upon arriving in the Eternal City, Grant made his way to the place that is home, away from home, for priests from Brooklyn. Tucked into Rome's bustling city center, the North American College is known as America's Seminary in Rome. It's home to seminarians and priests from around the country, including Brooklyn. As the cardinals get ready to enter the conclave, I visited the North American College to speak with Brooklyn priests and seminarians about their hopes for the next pope. I think there's a lot of expectation in the city. It's a, um, a lot of excitement, and I think a lot of hope more than anything else. I think people are very hopeful. Uh, they're grateful for the uh, example of Benedict. My own hope is that this Holy Father, I'm sure, will continue the great work done by, uh, by Pope John Paul II, Blessed John Paul II, and uh, Pope Benedict XVI, especially in terms of the new evangelization. I guess I've been spoiled. I was born in 81, so I um, was already into the to the papacy of John Paul II and blessed John Paul II and then now my last years of formation and then my first six years of priesthood um, were accompanied by the, the papacy of Benedict XVI so I feel like I've been spoiled with two excellent popes so my hope is just someone um, who will continue the great work that they've done. I feel that right now there's a there's a great need for someone of charisma uh, of uh, someone who has this uh, a personality that is able to reach out to many people. I think it was interesting to note the words of uh, Cardinal Tarcisio Bertone at the last Mass of Pope Benedict XVI on Ash Wednesday. He got up at the end of Mass and he thanked Benedict XVI for really showing what it means to be a priest. And he said, thank you for bringing God to man and man to God. So whoever it is, it's going to have to be a person that exercises that mission and uh, does it in uh, obviously a universal way as the universal pastor of the church. I think we're all hoping for the same thing. Someone that is obviously a witness of Christ. Overall, the suffering Christ, the loving Christ, the father figure. But personally, I would like to uh, say a man of hope and joy. And so, with less than 24 hours until the start of the conclave, it is with that same hope and joy that the Diocese of Brooklyn, with the church around the world, waits. Reporting from Rome, this is Grant Galicho with Currents. Well, when the next Holy Father is selected, he will face several great challenges. One of our experts helping us better understand these big issues is Father James Massa, theology professor at St. Joseph Seminary in Yonkers. Previously, Father Massa explained how reform of the Vatican is a crucial matter for the new pope. Tonight, he talks about the sex abuse scandal and the ways the next pontiff will address it.
the new pope will probably need to do two things, continue uh, to address uh, the problem uh, of sexual abuse, to make sure that the procedures in the church are effective in removing um, any, any priest, member of the clergy, a bishop, uh, anyone who is uh, either has committed sexual abuse or has been negligent in responding to cases of sexual abuse within his own territory. That's uh, the first order of business. The mm -hmm. second is also to draw attention to the tremendous uh, work that the local churches have done to create safe environments in our schools, our parishes. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a good positive message to share with the rest of the world. And I think the, the new Holy Father will We'll, we'll need to communicate that as well. Father Massa, as, as we talked earlier, uh, we are in uncharted territory, and as I, we try to assign some semblance of order yeah. to, to the conclave and our understanding of it, the uh, understanding that, that we all have is that there's this contest of four principal camps, and, and you actually mentioned one earlier, um, governance, there's also pastoral, there's third world and evangelical. We're gonna to touch upon as many as we can. There has clearly been a, a breakdown in, um, in authority in the, uh, in the in the departments of the of the Vatican, the mm -hmm. uh, those uh, closest to the Pope, uh, clearly one of them, um, you know, betrayed his uh, his his responsibilities, his role. Um, but you know, I, I think we also need to step back and and say that you know, uh, governance is not the only issue. I think very quickly he gets briefed by the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. um, he, by the way, has to reappoint all of the uh, key people in leadership roles in the Vatican itself. They all have to be, they all resign or they lose their, their title when, the, uh, the, when, the, when, the, uh, when we enter into the Sede Vacante mm -hmm. period. Most notably, I think, for, for many of us, the Swiss Guards. Yes, the Swiss <laughs> Guards the, and, all, and all the other heads of, of Roman uh, departments, mm -hmm. Roman um, offices uh, at the Vatican. So they need to be reappointed. He'll meet with the Secretary of State to get the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. What's pressing um, on the, the Holy See in regards to uh, international issues? Um, what churches are um, in crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of that needs to be tended to immediately. And then I suspect one by one he'll start to meet with the heads of those departments and begin to develop the agenda for this papacy. And one big external change for the College of Cardinals, their living quarters throughout the conclave. As we learn now, the hotel housing them today is certainly an improvement over sleeping in the hallways, as done in conclaves of the past. During the conclave, all cardinal electors, and also the next pope, will live in the Casa Santa Marta. In fact, staying here is not just part of a tradition, it's also part of the Vatican's apostolic law. But it wasn't always like this. Years ago, cardinal electors stayed along the hallways of the Apostolic Palace during the conclave. The setting wasn't very comfortable, especially for older cardinals. And so, John Paul II called for the construction of the Casa Santa Marta to accommodate cardinals and also future guests. The building was constructed in 1996, and it's located near St. Peter's Basilica. Usually, cardinals simply walk to the Sistine Chapel before the conclave, or they can take a shuttle. The five-story building has 106 units, 22 single rooms, and one apartment that stands out from the rest. The Pope himself, after being elected, will stay in that unit for a few weeks since the papal apartments are still sealed. The apartment is a bit bigger than the other units. It's usually reserved for special guests. For example, Patriarch Bartholomew stayed there. The Casa Santa Marta includes a chapel that's dedicated to the Holy Spirit. It's here that cardinals pray as they begin the conclave and vote in the most important election of their lives. And also, cardinals who wish to go to confession can do so inside the building, where regular clergy will be available to administer confession in different languages. And remember, join us tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for our special coverage of the conclave. And finally tonight, our Jim Mancari joins us with the news about the Catholic high school basketball teams playing for the city championship.
in a rematch of this year's Brooklyn Queens Championship. The Christ the King Royals squared off against the Bishop Lachlan Lions in the AA New York City Basketball Championship played Sunday at Fordham University. The game was close after the opening half, but the Royals pulled away in the second half to earn a 78-63 victory. Senior guard John Sevier led Christ the King with 19 points, while fellow senior forward Jordan Fuchs added 17 points. For Bishop Lachlan, junior guard Kadeem Carrington scored a game-high 24 points and junior guard Michael Williams finished with 19 points. Just, uh, just one injury, like everybody was going for himself. So the coach, coach, as a coach, he, he, he did what he had to do to the win. So then everybody, I think he said this is a team that he recruited as a senior, because Coach Arbutella, he knew this too. This is a team he recruited. And then he, he did what he had to do. And then we, as a team, we did good and we went to winning. But it's not over yet. We're trying to get a ring and go in the States. I mean, me personally, this could have been my last game at a high level. So I really want to keep this going and take home the state. I had my doubts today because they're really good. It's not being a, the same team four times, it's beating a really good team four times. Christ the King won all four matchups this season over Bishop Lachlan, and the Royals have now won three of the past four city championships. But now I know why I coach. I really do. Seeing how happy they are, I was able to win, win one as a player, and, and I told them it's something that they'll never forget. You know, Lamar Odom, Speedy Claxton, whenever we're talking, we talk about the one that we won and the one that we lost. I feel good, man. I probably not smell right now, but I probably smell when I get in the house. For his efforts, Severe was named the MVP of the Catholic High School Playoffs. Fuchs and Royals Junior Center Adonis De La Rosa were selected to the all-playoff team. Oh, we keep shooting. That's what shooters do. Keep shooting. That's what shooters do. After three wins, we never underestimated them. We said they could still come back and beat us because that, that just gave them more like anger. They wanted to come back at us, but we, we held it and we came up with the victory. We could sustain our play and, and be strong and defensively, and we won the game. Well, we had we had to we had to buckle down in the fourth quarter and get some stops to win the game. You know, John Sevilla on their best player, and we put Jordan Fuchs, our senior, on Mike Williams, their best player. I don't know what they had in the second half, but it seemed like we were doing a really good job. With a win in the city championship, Christ the King moves on to the New York State Federation tournament starting March 23rd in Albany. Reporting for Currents, I'm Jim Mancari. Uh, and thank you for joining us tonight. A reminder to stay with Currents for special live coverage of the Conclave and all the events surrounding the selection of our next Pope. We will have every development for you as it happens. Be here tomorrow morning when we begin our coverage of the start of the Conclave at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. And certainly join us tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. for a complete roundup with our Currents news team. We leave you now with preparations for the Conclave all around the Vatican. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Fobles. Have a good night.